it's showtime uh, as it tells me there hello team welcome to another atp geopolitics video with myself jonathan ms pierce and i have my esteemed guest soon to be on she has just contacted me to say uh, in a minute so she'll be here she's read my messages she'll be here soon so i'll give you uh, her proper introduction when she pops on to the live things are obviously quite challenging at the moment in Ukraine in general, obviously, and in Kharkiv, particularly as a city that is being consistently hammered by the Russians for the uh, fairly obvious reason that, well, A, it's the second biggest city in uh, in Ukraine, and also it is incredibly close to the border. In fact, this is probably a good time to just give you a little intro. I know most of you will know this, but for those who don't, here is... Ukraine. Here's my map at the moment. I haven't done my mapping update for you yet today. That's something to look forward to later. Here's a map of Ukraine. We've got Kiev up there, uh, fairly central to Ukraine as a whole. But then right over, much further closer to the front lines, we have Kharkiv or Kharkiv here. That is just a stone's throw, really, from the Ukrainian border, Ukrainian-Russian border. So right into the center of Kharkiv, that's sort of 35 kilometers. Uh, and that just means that if, if the Russians want to throw any uh, ordnance into Kharkiv, it's relatively easy. 100 kilometers uh, is is goes past Belgorod. So Belgorod itself is incredibly close. Now, what that means is that they can pretty much hit Kharkiv with most medium distance munitions. Obviously, some of their artillery is not going to reach there, although that it was a case that it could have done. But earlier on in the war, they were receiving all sorts of ordnance, including cluster munitions. And so when the Russians complained about the Ukrainians getting hold of cluster munitions from Russia, of uh, sorry, from the US and elsewhere, the the, the Russians were complaining about that, the they didn't have a leg to stand on because they themselves had used cluster munitions on Kharkiv and that's been caught on camera. But anyway, it is at the moment getting hit by uh, any number of things, including relatively recently, we understand that it's being hit by these guided glide bombs that are being dropped from airplanes that can now fire them apparently from 90 kilometers away but certainly from 70 kilometers away so it's it's quite easy for the for those planes to operate around the belgorod city area uh, and be able to hit Kharkiv, and that means that they are getting hit with some substantial munitions that cause quite a lot of damage as well as and this is another big problem, the S-300s or even S-400s surface-to-air missiles. So these surface-to-air missiles can be and are being launched from the Belgorod Oblast and are being flung into Kharkiv. And when these are used, they are normally in their primary mode used as surface-to-air missiles, but they can be used in a ground attack mode that gives them uh, an, an advantage that they're very difficult to shoot down. They take a ballistic trajectory, and that means you need things like a Patriot system to shoot them down. I'm going to talk to uh, my guest in in a while about how difficult that is, how challenging that is for the Ukrainians in terms of getting air defense systems there. Because I have a sneaky suspicion that it is too risky to put decent air defences around there because of its proximity to the Russian border, which means that it's going to continue to be very difficult to shoot these uh, missiles down. And in fact, they might, might not be able to. And what does that mean for the residents of the city going forward? Um, but yeah, so that is uh, that is a challenge. So they are they are getting consistently hit with uh, missiles and bombs. And as one of the major cities of Ukraine, that is massively challenging for the obviously for the citizens, but also for the economy of Kharkiv and for the logistics of doing business and just basically living. It is incredibly uh, difficult living in a war zone. And that's something that Anastasia is hopefully going to be talking to us about the challenges she has faced over the course of the war. It's now two years into the war and I actually interviewed her relatively early in the war relatively early in as far as my channel is concerned in fact i wonder if it's early enough that it was on my other 
channel, my A Tippling Philosopher channel, as opposed to my ATP Geopolitics channel. And we we spoke about the the, the challenges of being at war and uh, what her experiences was uh, were. And so it'd be interesting to see the comparison from then until now. Um, so Kharkiv is, as mentioned, the second biggest city in Ukraine. Obviously, Kiev is is the capital and therefore the biggest city. Uh, and then, so if we come back to the map here, you got Kiev over there, you got Kharkiv up here, and then you have Odessa down there. I think it's the third biggest city. Uh, and so many of these important cities, Dnipro, Zaporizhia, Mikhailiv, Krivivir, uh, Kharkiv, are in range of many, uh, top, top, well, any city in Ukraine is in range of at least some of the Russian missiles, but these are able often to be hit by some of those, like Mikhailiv, Zaporizhia, Dnipro get hit by uh, surface-to-air missiles rather like Kharkiv. So there are certain cities that find themselves closer to the Russian lines that mean that they are more vulnerable to a wider range of munitions. And that presents its own challenge uh, for those cities. Um, but yeah, there you go. So as you, you can see here, for those who are uh, are here for the interview that is due to take place any minute i will give you i haven't had a, another message from her i'll just give you a little bit of a mapping update because i haven't done that so far today oh no here she is no you're not going to get that mapping update uh because uh, she is indeed here with us um so well, hello i apologize <laughs> no problem at all my, my camera doesn't want to work and it's doing weird things i don't know if you can see it but it's kind of like bleeping and doing this sort of thing behind me like it's, it's like we're, know, we're filming visible. you on a television yeah yes i don't know why but it's it, it doesn't uh, you have to you know deal with this i don't know how to fix it i'm too technically illiterate to do anything about it i will ask a friend later but at least it's working that's yeah, absolutely. you know better yeah. than any better than anything i, I well, apologize i know if it's if it's annoying that it's doing this thing i i can't do anything about it i give up <laughs> i don't no know how, how to fix it yeah so my oh, advice would my while. advice would be either turn it off and on or punch it and so you know i, I tried it i tried both thank you it's it's exactly my methods of fixing yeah. things but it didn't work unfortunately <laughs> it's i call it the the woman method i don't know if you people consider it sexist but i if something doesn't work i just turn it off and on to off and on and then when it's working i won you know but it, it, uh, anything so harder than that i just you know, apparently I it turns out that i'm a woman too so uh, there you go um <laughs> <laughs> i mean <laughs> Uh, and Anastasia, uh, welcome. Well, uh, really, really uh, happy to have you here, especially since you are due to come on a couple of Fridays ago. And um, yeah, there was rather an unfortunate strike on Kharkiv, Kharkiv as there often is. Uh, and I guess we'll talk about that. But it's been been a long time since we spoke. I spoke to you much earlier on in in the war, and. Uh, well, I guess before we get to sort of comparisons from then to now, for those that don't know you, maybe some of my viewers haven't seen you before. I know uh, people that follow you that, that are here obviously know who you are. Uh, do you want to give yourself a little bit of an introduction? Yeah, hello everyone. I am uh, Anastasia. I'm from Ukraine, uh, Kharkiv, which is uh, quite further to the east like quite close to russia we so just had a, a big uh, um introduction of the city by the way while you weren't here so they should know a little bit oh, about it. okay <laughs> yeah that's cool uh, but so yeah so i'm from there and i'm here right now actually not from there <laughs> i live in Kharkiv, so uh, i am a volunteer mostly i do donate help i help like uh, soldiers in the army with uh, getting donations and things like that and buying some equipment uh, they need uh, cars uh, like uh, clothing uh, drones sometimes things like that so all sorts of things and uh, yeah so i sometimes go to the front sometimes i just do it uh, you know from kharkiv uh, which is now considered to be like a near frontline city but not on the like direct front line so that's pretty much it i also have a twitter uh called ukrainian anna and uh sometimes talk with people <laughs> like this <laughs> that's about it i think uh yeah oh the camera is incredibly annoying even for me <laughs> I, I do apologize i but i don't know what what to do it's getting worse it seems yeah no, no yeah, yeah that's my it's, it's my, my twitter yeah 
So yeah, please for follow Maybe Anastasia. I, I got this wrong last time. So is it Anastasia Praskovova? Is that how to pronounce it? <laughs> Almost. <laughs> Not the worst one I heard. Uh, the name is quite good. Anastasia is good enough. Uh, the surname is very hard. I will give you that. It's uh, Paraskevova, but it's very hard for foreigners to say. So fuck it. Just don't pronounce it. Oh, sorry. Can I swear on it? Uh, but you just have so, you know, whatever. Sorry, should have asked. No, it's fine. Um, uh, so Somewhere there, okay. Yeah. Let's let's go with what you said. Yeah. I just Anna, right? Okay. Six yeah. out of ten. <laughs> so, uh, so. Call um, me Anna, okay? Just, yes, just yeah, uh, that absolutely. I invented this thing specifically for Western people. So go use it, okay? So talking about Kharkiv, uh, what part has the, has the city played in the war? I mean, as I as I introduced before you came on, it is very close to the front uh, to the front line, I guess, because it's close to the border, and therefore it gets hit by all sorts of munitions. We talked about S three hundred, S four hundred, the surface to air missiles that mm -hmm. ran into there. Yeah, those are. Uh, uh, those are horrible. And then you're now starting to get the aviation bombs, the guided glide bombs as well. Uh, so what kind of city is it just uh, aside from before, you know, before the war? What kind of a, a city do we understand Kharkiv to be? And then how has it been affected by the war up until now? Um, can you hear me? I freeze, yeah. it seems. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah I'm back. Um, I have some uh, problems still with the like internet and electricity. So um yeah so i apologize if it like lags or i go out of it it's not because i you know i'm rude it's because <laughs> the lights went off or something like that so as far as a, a city is affected uh you were correct mostly we were hit with s300 missiles from belgorod which is quite close to which is a russian city that mostly bombs my city primarily for two years so they launch those pretty much every day so it has been like a constant thing I have air raid now, actually, <laughs> right now. You can't right. hear it because I'm in the headphones. But yeah, it's currently right now we have sirens that uh, say that something is flying our way, most likely. So uh, I I would try to not blow up uh, on your stream because that would be uh, th that would get you demonetized, I think. But the uh, point is that uh, we have been hit with S-300 mostly. Also quite a lot of Iranian drones as of, I think, like, they got a lot more of those uh, in half a year, like something like that. In the beginning, we had little of those because uh, Russia was occupying quite a big chunk of Kharkiv region, which now we liberated. So it's no longer like an issue. But while they were occupying uh, Kharkiv region, they were shooting mostly artillery at the city from the mm. occupied area, which is much more convenient for them since artillery is much cheaper than missiles and they have a lot of it. Like, they have a lot of missiles too, but, you know, artillery is just insane amount of stuff. So while there was occupation, we were mostly shelled, like, about, like, from 10 to 50 times per, per day with artillery, mostly. But now, since they are much further away from Kharkiv because of our uh, counteroffensives and our successful liberation of Kharkiv region, they now use primarily S-300 uh, from Belgorod, Iranian drones. They're like Shahed's, they called. It's like kamikaze type of drone, that, yep. you know, suicide drones, I think you call them. Those guys. And recently we have uh, just, with, just a week, a new thing, which is aerial type of bombs which is new stuff. They didn't bomb uh, Kharkiv with aerial uh, bombs before. So they're called Cubs, but it's like a variation of a Cub, and I'm not like 100% sure how to call them in English. So I apologize if it's like not the, the right way to say it. But that's the new addition <laughs> to, the, to their bombing repertoire of my uh, bomb in my city. And um, yeah, we have recently a couple of those, and one of them uh, hit the residential house like area between two residential buildings and unfortunately killed the uh, older man on a bike. So that's about it. So, so I don't, I, I don't uh, <laughs> what, yeah. what kind what kind of city before we we continue on, like what destruction the Russians have done to Kharkiv, what kind of city is it? Is it is it um, obviously it's the second biggest city in Ukraine yeah. and there, mm -hmm. therefore it will have a, a big economy con uh, concerned with the city, but also, you know, is it a university city? Is it a, a cultural city? What would give, give us a flavor of what it would be outside of war? 
I'd say, like, before this whole, you know, full-scale invasion, I would say Kharkiv was uh, not only the second in size city, but also the second in, like, uh, basically everything else after the capital when it comes to business, when it comes to... We have, I think, I believe, if I'm not wrong, the biggest amount of universities and students that come from abroad. Not now, oh, wow. obviously. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but but before that, yeah, before there were a lot of foreigners in Kharkiv, comparatively to other cities in Ukraine. So, for example, in my apartment uh, building, uh, like a lot of like foreigners used to live. It mostly was people from India, people from um, Middle East, people from Africa, uh, some Asians as well, like Asian people from. I think we had Chinese. We had. Um, Vietnam, I think, like like a bunch of like uh, people basically from for, for, who came here to study mostly in Kharkiv region. So that was it. We'll have a lot of. It was used to call we used to be called like a student city because of so many younger people, even foreigners and Ukrainians who from traveled here from other parts of the country to go to the universities and you know get high education and things like that. So that's one thing. Also, second thing, it's pretty like a. Uh, it's what it used to be like a fun uh, place because uh, there was like a lot of music, bars, you know, pubs, like clubs, uh, theaters, things like that. So it was like culturally one of the, you know, the spots to go to. And uh, yeah, and so because of so many younger people lived here, it was also kind of like, you know, the place to chill. The place to be. So, and, and I guess with that, it mm. then has a, a big economy that that supports that or is supported by yeah that. businesses things like that yeah mm -hmm. yeah and and with that then you get your large power plants that obviously have to feed that but also might be near there to feed the general oblast and and larger region and of course that means and given its proximity its closeness to the border that means that it is very vulnerable. Uh, to being struck by Russia and also a city that the Russians wanted, certainly at the beginning of the war. And because, as we talked about in the last interview, it's a predominantly Russian speaking city, or at least was, yeah. that mm -hmm. that was fell into the whole idea of it being a Russian city, right, as far as what Putin was thinking. And of course, that's not we know that not to be true. Uh, so so. Tell us about what uh, Russia's intentions were for Kh for Kharkiv, and f what you think now. What what are they planning for it now? Well, uh, you are like hundred percent correct. The only thing is that uh, it was uh, in part very important for them to take even in two thousand fourteen. So even before the right. full scale invasion, I would yeah. the only thing I would correct is is this because mm -hmm. because for example when they managed to occupy uh, Donbas region not all of it but you know uh, for example Donetsk was one of the main cities in the east but yeah. the the eastern city was and always I hope will be <laughs> Kharkiv is like the, the the heart of the eastern Ukraine basically. So it's like yeah. the most important city in this part of Ukraine, which um, was one of their main goals. And they indeed tried to take it. They occupied most of the region and they were in Kharkiv as well, but they were repelled by our territorial defense. So also there were attempts to take it back in 2014. So, for example, there were very strong plans to make it into uh, what we call like people, what they call People's Republic something. Like, you know, like a separatist region. Like Which they, they tried to do uh, to Odessa as well, didn't they? So there are a number of places. Yeah, yeah, tried Odessa, to have these yeah, 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 definitely. Places. Yeah, Odessa and Kharkiv were definitely like the main goals in 2014 which they failed to achieve for various reasons. But uh, now it's still kind of like a main priority, but, you know, their appetites are a bit larger, obviously, because you could, you know, Kiev, there was like an attempt to take Kiev and Kiev region and everything. So there's like a much bigger uh, now uh, drive, I'd say. But uh, back in the day, if they did want indeed to cut off the eastern part, which uh, eastern and south part is also sort of like things that are considered uh, that by Russia to be like Russian by all counts. So yeah. they kind of consider all of Ukraine to be that, to be honest, but they they're have rights to it, is what they say. But uh, when it comes to East, it's definitely like their main main priority. And you're, like you said, it's also Russian-speaking 
uh, primarily Russian speaking uh, region, but especially the city um, because of the Russification in prior uh, years. So, for example, Russification when we were Russian Empire, this part of Ukraine has been in Russian Empire and also during Soviet times as well, of course, which Soviet Union, you know, it's basically Russian Empire with another name. So <laughs> because of that and another flag <laughs> and aesthetics, but at the end of the day, like, you know, it's still Russian dominated and uh, Russian is the dominating force both everywhere, like in it was in Soviet Union and it is in, it was in Russian Empire and yeah. So yeah, so they do did a lot of Russification policy back in the day, which would be like, for example, Emskyukas, Valuf Circular were the laws that were prohibiting publishing books in Ukrainians, that were prohibiting learning Ukrainian, teaching it in schools, you, uh, and uh, that was Russification. So uh, in in Soviet Union there wasn't there weren't really like straight up laws like there was in Russian Empire in 19th century, but uh, it was uh, heavily discriminated against, discouraged, and you wouldn't get like a decent job if you didn't speak Russian. So you had to like kind of adapt to be Russian. Not only Ukrainians, by the way. I'm talking like about Armenians, uh, Georgians, Greeks, whatever. Right. So it, it doesn't have to be like just about Ukraine. But uh, yeah, and also of course they executed our it's our writers so if yeah. anyone wants to look it up just uh, it's called executed renaissance i think there exists an uh, article about it somewhere in wikipedia maybe or somewhere else it's um uh, yeah, huge groups of uh, ukrainian uh, artists poets writers who were trying to write in ukrainian were just uh, straight up executed and gulagged so are they put in caps or just executed so i i did an like interview that. with a, i did an interview with a guy called jonathan from Turchny, who's who's this group of of uh, people trying to report accurately from ukraine and he was he's a british guy but he he's a like an arts kind of guy and he was talking about how there is an echo of that executed renaissance as as you were saying um in fact we can bring that up on wikipedia here but he was saying that like the element of you know what's been going on now with the death of so many cultural uh figures in ukraine artists yeah. and writers and this loss of you know I, I, cultural identity is something that that harkens back to that previous period i mean it's not exactly like that simply because they are not currently occupying us yeah, like yeah, full yeah, country yeah, you know yeah. so there's there, there's a little less like uh, for example like stalin times there was like mass executions mass repressions yeah. of people in ukraine in particular and other you know um other uh, areas as well but uh of course we are still losing our best people simply by the virtue of them going to serve and to defend their country yeah. So a lot of like our musicians, artists, uh, poets, writers went to defend the country when uh, the full-scale invasion happened. Or even earlier when uh, 2014, when annexation of Crimea happened and, uh, you know, invasion of Donbass and everything. So by just the virtue of that, we are losing our best people again. Uh, which has been the thing in uh, Russian Empire, Soviet Union, then Nazi occupation. Um, and then, uh, of course, uh, Soviet continuous, um, you know, discrimination and oppression of Ukrainian people, things like that. So, yeah, it is quite awful, <laughs> not going to mm. lie, because I do hope there will be a century in Ukrainian history when we don't lose the best people of our yeah. country to yes. death. I would appreciate that. But unfortunately, <laughs> today is yeah. not the day, it seems. Well, yeah, so, so talking about then, yeah. okay, about about what what Russia might want to do now. I mean, what do you think? Because they they are hammering, and I think this with Kherson, right down in Dnipro River, where they mm -hmm. controlled Kherson, and then they went on and took some of the oblast, and then they did that withdrawal, and then went back the other side of the river, and now they are hitting it rather similarly with all sorts of munitions. And my my sense yeah, is mm -hmm. that there there aren't really any military targets within Kherson city, and so what they're doing is just overt terrorism, and therefore they're just trying to either break the the spirit of the Ukrainians there, or simply it's this idea: if we can't have it, you can't have it either. So do you think that's what they're doing yeah, with that's Kharkiv? Very Russian. 
<laughs> yeah, yeah, that's yeah. a very Russian mindset. Yeah, but uh, other yes, partially this yes, but also there seems to be uh, active. Uh, at, at least it has been reported as such that there has been active plans to try take Kharkiv again. So yeah. we expect pretty major. Um, like a flood of Russian attacks uh, in all sorts of region, but it's kind of like like predicted to be in the end of May and beginning of June, something like that. So yeah, so we are kind of preparing for that now. It's and that's maybe the reason consi- why. They... It's interesting to consider oh, that sorry, because yeah. in order in order to do that, you've got to have a lot of troops. I mean, if you're going to take the second biggest city, yeah, they failed to do that already at the height of their strength, yes, right, the Russians. Yeah. So mm-hmm. in order to do that again, well, they, they are doing really have... uh, they're they are doing mass mobilization now. So maybe that's the reason why, like the preparing into for that attack. But it's not certainly, in my opinion, it's not one hundred percent thin. So yeah, yeah. I'm I'm like I'm just saying what people are reporting yeah, yeah. basically. So what, what there is a possibility of that, whether yes. it will actually happen, you know, it's best to be prepared than not. Yeah, oh yeah, I, yeah, one hundred percent. Yeah, <laughs> I just I I just spend my days thinking about well, what would I do if I was Putin? Well, I'd probably commit suicide if I had any moral fiber. But no, <laughs> like if if I was P- Putin, I really wanted to achieve it. again. What would I want to achieve? But I just think something like attacking Kharkiv would be so counterproductive for them ultimately but but as you say it it is something that they definitely want like they want far more than i think they can feasibly get and the the latest today was that that 300,000 uh, are rumored to be mobilized in june and that would fit into like yes that's the, the rumor yeah mm-hmm. yeah that would fit into that's... the summer offensive so what they do with them i don't know yeah uh well they will try something i suppose oh, because obviously. uh for the simplest of re- the, what the simplest of reason is uh you have to like kind of like understand the uh, mindset of uh russia as a uh, people not just mm-hmm. uh, putin himself but as a uh, you know as a country um they um people who do support putin in russia and it's a lot it's not all obviously but it's quite a huge chunk uh, of people who either support him or think he's a necessary evil or something of that sort that would what yeah. my uh, relatives would say you know I'll repeat in their language in russia i mean i have a lot of you know my mom is basically russian so uh, most of the relatives of mine uh, are in russia or in greece by my father's side so yeah point is that they need he needs to show them something so if you are a guy who is uh, basically brought to power and held uh, and was like uh, rising up on the platform of being the security guy, on the platform of being like, I will defend Russia, I'm a strong leader, you know, who is a, you know, imperialist dreams will be achieved. And, you know, we deserve this, we deserve that. We're the second army in the world. We're like the best Slavic people. The rest Slavic people are inferior. We are the superior Slavs, like pan Slavicism, it's called, but whatever, it's a long story. So point is, if you sell them that for long, long years, and they kind of believe it, you know, like the majority of people, then you need to somehow show it. And what he has now to show is a couple, I don't know, like destroyed villages. <laughs> so they didn't take any major cities. Kherson was pretty much the only one they truly managed, but we retook it. So the only one they have now is Mariupol, which is uh, a pile of rubble with uh, corpses buried all over the place. So, um, so they have nothing to show, and they need to show something. And uh, major goals were like you, we talked about Kharkiv and Odessa, and uh, at least something needs to be uh, achieved. So well, there's so only my... so much you can sell. Uh, for example, I don't know if you've seen it, but there was like recent, uh, recent speech of Putin uh, about Avdivka, which is like a small little thingy in. Uh, Donbass region that they took and when he was doing his speech like basically talking about the successes of Russian army he unironically like with a straight face said that they took like 15 apartment buildings or something like that and they are holding them yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So you like I- imagine like the cringe, like any normal person would feel. But even like Russians who are like very uh, imperialist minded, who I would call fascists, honestly. But you know, people get triggered when you say that. But <laughs> so basically, because they hear it and they're like, 
the hell, man? Like uh, 15 blocks is what we're celebrating as a great victory. So, yeah, so I think he, yeah, they are getting desperate with their uh, failure, frankly, yeah. uh, to achieve and, uh, their initial goals. So, well, see, yeah. See, I, I think one of the, the main things they want to achieve is that Lambridge to Odessa. And you've heard Russian, we've, mm -hmm. we've heard Russian, um, generals very explicit, explicitly talk about this uh, uh there it is uh yeah and th that's because r really it's so important for them to get hold of odessa being the the third biggest city and also it it, it is has oh, it's incredible, historically important to them yes yeah. yeah culturally important but also economically mm -hmm. absolutely uh vital for ukraine so if ukraine doesn't have yep. the the land bridge that this whole land bridge to transnistria then it can't access the black sea and it can't do um exports of agricultural products and, and produce and then the, therefore ukraine becomes economically uh, uh you know, kneecapped is in a really yes, yes. bad place, and and Russia then gets mm -hmm. to its self control, trade, and this obviously there's a lot of arable land here, a lot of fertile agricultural land. So Russia really would like this land from here to yeah, of uh, course. Transnistria. And so uh, right, uh, well, the Russia question is I, also you know, oh sorry, yeah. Well, I was just gonna. The question I have for you is. I know, I know you're not a military expert, but but with your mm -hmm. Ukrainian hat on and knowing what you know about the war, <laughs> what do you Ukrainian realistically hat. think is the maximum that Russia could achieve? Like, if everything went really well for the Russians, like, I don't think that they can at all take Ukraine, right? They don't have the ability to take Ukraine. I don't think they have the ability to take Kyiv. So what would I think is is a maximum? Well, I have to think hard about that. What do you think is a maximum they could achieve if, if they did as well as they could? It's a, uh, you mean uh, initially or now? Like now, currently? now, like now. Uh -huh. Well, frankly, that fully depends on uh, no shade to you guys, but our allies. Yeah. So we are currently having a pretty bad ammunition shortage and a pretty bad situation overall when it comes to aid, which, for example, we haven't received pretty much anything from United States in half a year at this yeah. point. And it doesn't seem like it's going to be fixed anytime soon, no. um, considering like the elections and everything going on in the United States. And yeah. uh I do believe sincerely, that's just, you know, my opinion. So take it as, a, as my opinion, uh, that uh, Russia is taking advantage of that fact. Yep. And uh, considering how much harder they are now hitting us, that they're, they dare to, uh, for example, get their planes closer uh, to Kharkiv, which they hadn't done since uh, March 22. So uh, take that into consideration. And of course, our shortages, they are well aware of those. And uh, I think they will try to take advantage of that fact. And uh, ever since they basically started to see, I think, how uh, like traditional warfare was not really working for them because they couldn't really move forward with it. And they yeah. lost quite a lot of things they initially took. So uh, Kyiv region, Kharkiv and her, partially Kherson. So uh, they then turned to kind of like hybrid warfare, which are their best and strongest suit. So propaganda affecting uh, politicians all over the world uh, and trying to handicap uh, Ukraine, uh, support to Ukraine that way, which we rely on since uh, no matter how much fun we make of them, they still remain to be gigantic army that, uh, you know, uh, is 30 times our size, the country itself. But uh, th they have more people, they have more weaponry. And yes, Western weaponry is uh, higher, it's, it's better, it's like superior. But if you don't have much of it, so like just to make an example, by the way, I just brought bought a car for um, uh, a division, a mechanic uh, brigade in uh, Kupensk region, which is quite close to, you know, to Kharkiv. And yep. uh, I went there and basically the notion is that just in this region alone, there is about like uh, 100 something tanks operating now, Russian ones. And our guys have like three or four. 
So just to make this uh, like, you know, drastic difference in the amount of stuff uh, understandable for people. So despite our enthusiasm, despite our like will and the fact that our people are, you know, very good <laughs> at fending off Russians, it, there's only so much you can do with such a disparity. Never mind the lack of air superiority at all. With not superiority, we don't have anything basically in the air. So I, because of that, it's incredibly difficult. And uh, I do worry, as most Ukrainians worry, that this will negatively impact our ability to not only take uh, back more of our land, but actually defend the things we already So do back. you think that so, Russia could yeah. realistically take Kharkiv or no, even Kharkiv, Odessa? Kharkiv, no, but no. No. no, I don't think so. But but depends right. uh, on quite a lot of factors. They can push through in some regions, for example, in uh, already liberated parts, such as like yeah. Kharkiv region, for example, Kupansk maybe, or maybe, uh, you know, uh, they, they do some advancement in Zaporizhia, maybe region, uh, or even like uh, maybe south, like Kherson region, who knows. But uh, they do talk about Kharkiv mostly. Like their media people, you know, the Kremlin spokesperson people and, uh, you know, TV presenters, things like that. So they took, talk about like destroying Kharkiv, annihilating it, like turning it to dust and all shit like that. And that this place needs to be raised and like everyone needs to be, you know, <laughs> you know what. <laughs> so they're yeah, talking yeah, yeah. about that mostly. So I suppose that's maybe the plan, but that also can be like a destruction and they actually want to do something else. That's also possible. So, yeah, but at but, the end of the day, our successes are very tied to our um, to aid because yeah. there's no way in hell that we can do it on, in, you know, on our own. But, that, and but that's so interesting I think that because should be understandable. even what you're saying is that, uh, you know, even... In, in a worst case scenario, the Russians, you can't envisage, and I'm the same as you here, I can't see that the Russians yeah. can take like huge amounts of land back. I just think they are stuck in this war that they've had so much of their equipment attrited, even if the US don't give that much aid anymore or any aid, actually Europe's really stepping up at the moment. And there's now further yeah, talks about... Yeah. Uh, the, you know, there's talk about the Czech initiative for for artillery ammunition. There's now talk today and yesterday about yeah, Estonia. Yeah, yeah. Estonia has now found possibly another 1.2 million shells. You've got the Ukrainian. I wonder when they say they found them. Where have it's they just like been? Back of the back of the sofa. <laughs> it's like oh, oh here it is. It fell out oh, my ammunition. Yeah, Yay, send in those. But yeah. but you've got you've got then the industrial military complex in Europe is starting to pick up. In Ukraine is also yeah. being uh, picking up, and so. I think that my personal opinion is Russia is going to be trying the hardest now because of what you said, taking advantage of the US situation. They're trying to attack the hardest now. Well, if this is the best they can do, which and, and look at the lost, losses they've just taken in Tonyanka near Abdivka, look at Nova Mikhailivka, they've just mm -hmm. taken another huge set. Apparently today they've lost a load or last 24 hours in Terni as well. Uh, so I think that even with 300,000 people, they don't have the uh, training the, and the weapons to really make proper use of those people i think i think like my worst case scenario for for you for russia or worst case scenario for ukraine sorry is that russia like you said takes some more land maybe gets most of the donbass you know mm -hmm. advances to the west maybe down here and around here but i can't see them with ukraine digging in and building their own fortifications i can't see russia doing crazy well and and so therefore the success is is all about how much aid is given but i think some of that aid is being put in place from europe that is long term aid as well that's not just now and for the next 6 months actually they're putting things in place nato's talking about a 5 year plan uh, and this is really good news for ukraine and i just think yeah. i just think I'm quite positive, even though I know it's really bloody difficult for Ukrainians on the ground. And and actually, this gets on to another question I, I wanted to ask you about, which is mobilization. But was there, what, so before I go on to mobilization, what do you think the best case scenario is for Ukraine? Where, if, if everything went well and, and the US suddenly gave them loads of stuff, it gave you guys loads of stuff, what, what do you, do, do you think Ukraine could get back to the, to 1991? Could you get Crimea back? Can they get all of the Donbass back? Uh, well, that's sort of like the hope for like absolute best case scenarios to go at the very least to um, to get everything back before 22 part of the invasion. 
like you know year 22 yeah. that's like the pr pretty good case but of course getting the entirety of donbass and crimea is uh, the ultimate goal but whether that would happen it depends i guess on the successes or failures i guess we would see um in like a year this year and uh, you know everything else and um i i'm not like giving up and most ukrainians are not giving up on that idea but at the very least we need to be on um sturdy ground and um if, if there would any be we we need to be on a on a like you know stronger foot at the end mm. of the day to for example we attack and quite heavily as much as we can or russian uh, oil production in mm. uh, russia itself so oil oil is basically their main uh, money for the financing of the war itself so there's a lot of things we can do that can handicap them but there's also a lot of things they can do for example they have uh, bombed uh, us pretty heavily there was the heaviest bombing of uh, kharkiv infrastructure critical infrastructure and uh, power stations things like that i think since uh, the beginning actually of war so yeah. 50 percent of our power grid uh, is down currently which is pretty huge for a and big city. Down. With, yeah, uh, yeah. Yeah. yeah, 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 and it, and it, it, yeah, and it will be down for a long, long time because the damage was so strong, and uh, it, it sure it left like million something people with uh, no electricity, no water, no internet, no cell phone connection, um, no heat, no anything. But the worst part is that it also, of course, affects our military operations. It mm. affects, you know, a lot of things. And um, yeah, so they can so, still, you know, do substantial damage to us as well. So I don't know. I'm not pessimistic, but I'm also like not, not exceptionally like optimistic as well. So I, yeah. I'm more in the boat of we will see how it goes. And from there, we can already assess what our realistic goals can be. But now I think we're not at that stage that we can, no. that we need to think think oh should we give away this should we give away that we're not at that stage yet as is in my opinion so I really, now we're fighting I, I really want to talk to you about you just mentioned refineries but before I get onto that because I think that's a really important topic and especially with regard to what you guys think about what America have said and what even Emmanuel Macron and France have said but before we oh, get there yeah. yeah mobilization so what what's the because for my opinion of the war is that it's a really easy war for Ukraine to win conceptually right so all ukraine needs is one loads of stuff and that's just ammunition weapons jets missiles things that we can just build and give to ukraine it's not it's not impossible it's not even particularly difficult it just takes political will and a bunch of money right so if the west basically yeah. if the west really wants ukraine to win it's actually quite simple here's a load of things okay but the other part of that is boots on the ground, right? So Ukraine needs to, their part of the bargain would be, you guys need boots on the ground to do the fighting. And that seems to be something that that um, Zelensky is very reticent to do. He, he doesn't particularly want to do it because of the economic impact, the uh, social impact, uh, uh, his the impact on his uh, perceptions and popularity and the fact that it will make people flee the country and that will have a further impact on the economy. What's your view on mobilization? What's the general public's view that you, of people you've spoken to? Uh, is it is it deeply unpopular, but do people realize it has to happen? How are people dealing with the, this this problem? It's a bit of a you know complicated subject because, uh, of course, in the initial uh phase should, should say of the war it was primarily based of people who volunteered and who went um, you know to serve uh, on like the very next day on the exact same day like on the voluntarily know, yeah fourth February 25th. yeah so because of that there was no um not much talk even about things like that simply because there was no need to there was enough uh people and people who just volunteered to do it and wanted to do it out of their own free will uh and so yeah so that was not like kind of like an issue anybody talked about much but now it's an issue to talk about simply because uh first of all unfortunately a lot of people died who initially went to defend the country that's one thing and uh second thing is that um when you do counteroffensives, when you do any like sort of offensive action, you need much more people, like just in general, than you need to defend. Yeah. So because of that, there is a need for more people. And um, 
it might be necessary at some point uh, to do like you know mobilization in a way that people are enlisted whether they want to or not let's say but it is of course a you know a very it's a complicated subject simply because i for example fully understand you know the fear of people and um, their reluctance to do it and because war is horrific it's horrendous uh, it's definitely one of the most horrifying things that ever happened in humanity uh, not this war in particular but just you know all wars in general so uh, i understand and i can't fault people uh, for you know being scared honestly so it's just you know it's I can't do it simply also because I'm a woman and I will not be like, uh, you know, drafted. So in that sense, I also tend to not to judge people who can be, which is men. Yeah, so, and I uh, think that's really yeah, important. So I, I always try and talk about this, how how it's easy for someone like me sitting on the other side of the world or whatever to say, Oh yeah, you're a coward for not for not um yes, yes, you know, yes. for not volunteering or for trying to escape mobilization. But actually, how would I feel if I had a family, I have my own life and my dreams? And then I was yeah, thinking, right, yeah. even though I fully agree that that defending my homeland is is the right thing to do, as in, you know, I really support the Ukrainian armed forces, but would I say, right, I'm gonna up sticks and go and put my life on the line to the point that where I think there's a high probability I'm not going to make it back in one piece. Like yes, Actually, that's a yes. very different human calculation. And I think it's easy for us to judge when we're not in that situation ourselves. However, if you want Ukraine to survive, then you can't just yes, free yes. ride on the back of other people doing that work for you. And so that there, there are these tensions that psychological It's a complicated tensions. thing. I'm very, uh, you know, emotionally attached to soldiers. So, mm -hmm. of course, when they are like, fuck those you know, people who are not fighting and sitting at home, like men primarily, I understand their side and I empathize with it more because things they're going through are um, not easy to even describe. And it's, of course, uh, but at the same time, there are a lot of men and women who are volunteers who do other work as well. And uh, there are men who work in jobs, like, you know, support the economy, their families, which is mm. also important because it keeps the country in, afloat. It's not yeah. just the soldiers, although they are the most important people, obviously. But at the end of the day, there are businesses, there are uh, money, there is economy, there are things like that, there are taxes, you know, everything. So all of that is also, of course, important thing to do. And uh, but there's a big difference, of course, between uh, paying and money, uh, helping soldiers as a volunteer even and being actually on the front lines and with the explosion guts uh, and horrors all over yeah. you around. You know, with how, how, the, how the limbs of dying. Uh, so, yeah, but how I, if, soldiers, if, I will say you, this. Yeah. Sorry, just one thing. If mobilization becomes like an absolute necessity and we have such a shortage of people, then I do think it will happen, obviously. And, uh, you know, this war was forced upon us and it's not something we chose to do, but it's something we have to do, unfortunately. So how, how do the soldiers many you people understand that? How do the soldiers you speak to feel about mobilization? What do they feel about Zelensky not having mobilized already? Are they angry they're like, that, that there isn't mobilization or do they understand? Actually, like two opinions, like they are completely different from each other. Yeah. But uh, these are the ones I hear the most from in yeah. people in on the front, soldiers themselves. So one group says like, yeah, mobilize people because it, it can be just us. It needs to be like, you know, more people. And they're like salty, you would say, about uh, people not mobilizing. But there are also a huge chunk of people who say that uh, uh, they rather not have people who don't want to be here because right. the quality of those, before, of, that, yeah. of those people is way, way less than people who actually volunteered and the people who are actually willingly doing their thing. So I understand that perspective as well because the sheer will and the fortitude and the... Uh, just uh <laughs> they're mad lads okay people who are there they volunteered they're, it's a completely different breed of uh people and the effectiveness of them as you saw i mean during mm -hmm. the fact that everyone want, thought we will be like you know rolled over i don't know like in three days or something and the people that are repelling 
a humongous force um, and successfully, in my opinion, uh, and I think, you know, everyone's opinion. So they are doing it partially out of the sheer will to do it, you know, to defend their homeland. And they are there because they want to. So yeah. that's a completely different thing. And there are plenty of like, especially commanders, like officers, people like a bit higher in rank than um, just, you know, the lower soldier. And they always say that the actual like um, mindset and the psychology of people is what's definitely like the most important when you consider operations, when yeah. you consider things like that. So that's like two opinions I hear. So like a bit I'm... a bit of a like soldiers that are a bit lower in ranks, mostly just uh salty, as I said. Mm. Soldiers who are a bit higher in ranks are actually a bit more like you know skeptical yeah. about actually dragging people there. But you don't have and... to actually drag them. You can give them the you know the how it's called Pavestka. <laughs> I don't know how it's called in English. Uh, the thing you give them to enlist, but they're not actually a thrown on the front immediately. So, for example, a lot of my friends are getting like those, uh, you know, messages that you should come to the um, to the recruitment center yeah. and just register. Yeah. So be registered, but you are not actually like, going anywhere like right yeah. now. For example, one of my friends actually got such a register letter. So what he did is, uh, he's uh, my dude friend from Kharkiv. He um, packed his bag. He packed like the <laughs> his favorite snacks. He packed like the the vest, the helmet, like everything in one thing. So if he needs to grab it, he will be able to. But for now, he works as an electrician as he did. So right, um, and in, indeed, Zelensky's yeah. changed the well, the Vukovna Rada, I think, have, have changed the rules, ratified that the age has moved from 27 down to 25, so the general conscription yeah. can so, involve yeah. more people. So they're trying to do things that means they can get hold of more people without doing a mass mobilization. So I do understand that, yes, um, I, of, okay, yeah. so it's, it's, a, it's a complicated thing, yeah, basically, yeah. it's kind of hard to to it's it kind of easy to judge of that if you're not actually like uh here mm. but um yeah it, it's a very complicated feeling because for example when my friends most of who enlisted by their own you know initiative back in march 22 um or february 22 uh, i was super duper proud of them and very grateful that they are doing it but at the same time very upset you know because yeah. uh, they're risking their lives and I will probably likely, it's quite likely that I will never see them again, you know. It's and, incredibly uh, brave thing I to want... do. And we, we take it for granted, yes. like, that. you know, when we are analysing uh, across, uh, you know, across the lands and seas as we are uh, sitting in uh, comfortably in our houses going, yeah, you just need to mobilise more. Or, yeah, just go to war. It's like imagine being that person packing the bag, as you just said, and saying, right, I'm leaving my family. I'm leaving my job. I'm leaving my friends. I'm leaving my pets. And I am, or whatever it is, and I am, and I am packing everything away to go to somewhere where I've got a significant chance of not coming back in one piece or the same person. I might be, I might be killed, or I might be injured and physically less able than I'll ever be, or psychologically scarred. You know, the, the, it is a huge thing to say I am going to put my life on my line for this this abstract idea of of my homeland and and freedom. And so I think it's incredibly brave, incredibly, and we take it for granted too much yes but many people understand that it's a necessity of course and they will mm. for example like my friend like he packed his yeah. stuff so he's kind of like prepared if it happens he will do it so he has no plans Limp. to you know do anything else he is prepared but i, I mean he's when i speak with people who my men uh, who are not you know who just live regular lives who are not mobilized and uh they usually say something like of that sort so if they are getting um uh, you know draft it then they will do it but uh as long as it doesn't happen they will continue to you know live their lives as is now like donate to the army maybe doing some volunteer work supporting their families things like that but if it happens they will do it but it's not something they will you know run yeah. to do in particular and, and uh i uh so going back to the idea of refineries uh where we have seen Ukraine hit uh, oil refineries to and crude production facilities and export facilities to the point where somewhere between 
10 and 18 percent of or something like that of russian oil refinery uh, refining capacity has been affected um has been cut and that's incredible because that stops the funding of the war and yep. is it is incredibly powerful but we've had the us coming out and saying actually we're not a fan of this and there are different reasons being touted for why that is the latest i've heard from certain people in the know is that actually it's to do with escalation and not to do with economics although that might play a part but it's more to do with escalation and then we've had emmanuel macron come out and say I think if Ukraine are fine to hit the refinery, thank you very much. And so you, we've got Emmanuel Macron moving away from the US and taking the EU. I am becoming a bit of a massive fan of Emmanuel Macron at the moment because he's saying <laughs> everything you, right. The French. Yeah, I know. It's like, the like, people. Yeah, it's funny. You say I'm uncomfortable, a, honestly. Yeah. But, but you know, for a British guy, you know, we, we've got a long-standing love affair with the French or, or not. Yeah, so, yeah, you yeah. Know, yeah, yeah. That's but, why I'm but, joking about it. Yeah, no. yeah exactly. And yeah. But Emmanuel Macron is just in the zone and he's not just saying it. He's actually changing things and moving the industrial yeah, um, doing things military well. complex yeah. and he's doing things and he's taking Europe and you've got Germany, if not Olaf Scholz, Germany itself is is doing a lot in, in terms of they, they have given the second most in the world after the US, but actually since in the last six months, they've given the most like the, we've got this move away from US dependency and and Macron saying things that is 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 I think allowing Europe to stand on its own two feet away from the US. And I think there's some strategizing going on from the EU there. What, what I'm interested in though, and I, I see this and I'm a really big fan of Macron at the moment. I, I, I'm interested to, to, to see how much filters down to the Ukrainians on, on, on the ground in, well, both in the war, but also civilians. Uh, how what's their view of the US at the moment given six months and, and who do they blame for that? And do they blame it? Are they angry with the Americans? And what do they think about the Europeans? And maybe what do they think about Emmanuel Macron? What, what are your views there? So in general, I think it's a good thing that Europe is uh, trying to be more um, less dependent on United States and NATO in general, like, you know, um, because simply because of just how, how to say it without sounding... <laughs> very mean but um so in the united states they're like uh okay i will say it how i think it okay whatever so uh, sorry to my american friends but their political thing is unhinged so it's so unpredictable it's so like the fact that trump can be for example a president and it's a very real possibility and nobody knows what the hell he will do. So one day he says that NATO, NATO sucks and he will, you know, withdraw uh, United States from NATO. The next day he says something else. So what he will actually do, nobody knows. But to depend fully on a person like that and on a country like that is a bit not good, especially in the climate today if it was peace that's one thing but there's a huge war in, yeah. in europe that is much closer to europeans than it is to united states people obviously like you know so for them to worry about that thing for poland to worry about it for baltic countries to worry about it is much for Czechia, right uh, who found ammunition <laughs> million ammunition on their couch so that's really understandable that people are trying new approaches, new routes, and new maybe ally ships as well. And there has to be someone who will be sort of like a leading force in it, who would, you yeah. know, do this change. And I think Macron wants to be that person. Yeah. So um That's exactly what I've been saying just... for some time, actually. Yeah, we've needed in Europe someone to rally everyone around them. It doesn't look like Biden can do that because it's become partisan. It's become this Democrat Republican yeah, yeah. thing, annoyingly, mm -hmm. and it, it shouldn't be, but it is. And therefore it needs to be a European. I don't think it can be a British person easily because of the you know we're not in the EU. So so I think it, the choice yeah, yeah. is either mm -hmm. either going to be Maloney um Schultz or Macron, because I think it needs to be one of the big countries, because someone like Kaya Kallas uh, or some of the Baltic yeah, no, no, nations. Yeah, it doesn't have such an influence, yeah. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So I think it can only really be Macron. And as a result, I think he stepped up and he's doing it. Sorry to interrupt. Yeah, he also seems to be like, uh, at first I was like, mm, that's just talk, you know. Uh, first of all, because, you know, French. 
Yeah. <laughs> second, second of all, it's just I thought, ah, I mean, talk is cheap, right? Anyone can, you know, say pretty words of uh, we need to stop Putin. It's like a European war and you know, all of that is blah, blah, blah at the end of the day, right? But then he started to actually do actions. And since he started visiting uh, Czechia and Baltics and, you know, like trying to somehow establish a more, uh, I think, prominent partnership with uh, countries who are very interested in NATO, <laughs> which yeah. are everyone on Russian. If you look at the map who pays the most of their GDP to NATO, it's well, everyone with borders with Russia, you know, and in close proximity with Russia. It's Baltics, it's Poland, it's, uh, I think it's Romania as well. I think all, like, all countries, the Czechia, yeah. Slovakia, Slovenia, everyone. Yeah. You know, so you can you can clearly see who is, like, a bit, uh, you know, uh, shit and bricks a little bit. So, uh, because of that, <laughs> I, I'm, of course, understandably so, because most of those yeah. people are not only close yeah. to Russia, they also have been occupied by Russia in the past. Yes. So they quite, quite literally know how how great that feels so because of that i think there are our biggest allies in general but thing is they have less influence still in european yeah. union than for example westerner countries such as germany and france so since germany is not gonna do it obviously shorts no offense to you dude but you know you ain't it so maybe macron thought that he will do it and i am for it okay so obviously we have been a little bit uh, everyone everyone has been saying in ukraine like what have they been adding to croissant these days yeah you know? Brilliant. Just... And, and he's, but it's not just yeah. those countries he's been going to as well i mean if you actually look at what macron's been doing over time and there's some uh, there's a rumor or it's not even a rumor i think it is actually an accepted fact that the reason why he macron was telephoning putin all the time at the beginning of the war was because Zelensky had asked him to. So it wasn't that he yeah, was being so, weak. Yeah. It, it was that actually Zelensky says, I said, I want you to be my conduit, my route to Putin to see if we can get something achieved. And meanwhile, we're doing I the war actually... things. Actually, kind of feel a little bit vindicated <laughs> because I was one of those people who didn't shit on Macron too much when he right. was doing the talks with Putin phase yeah. at the beginning. Because uh, many people in Ukraine and in in UK, I have you know friends in UK, and a lot of people have been, oh, you know, Macron, what the fuck? Like, you know, they oh, yeah. sorry, <laughs> they have been shitting on him on him relentlessly <laughs> for that. And I remember thinking maybe we shouldn't like judge so hard without like knowing the yeah. inner workings of it. And it seems like the inner workings were actually uh, that Zelensky wanted to um, grab at the chance and maybe stop in this, obviously, because uh, as long as there was a chance to maybe negotiate something, or maybe he basically said in that phone call um, that was, you know, showed to people leaked or whatever, I don't know, uh, that uh, you have like a large influence. And if like the Putin and everyone like in, in Russia sees like the Western, like the biggest players, so to speak, right? They are uh, uh, like heavily against it and don't encourage it. And like maybe it will affect something. I do think on Zelensky part, it was a bit of a desperation move yeah yeah and, well and so it's really interesting to talk about leaked phone call like he um there's leaked phone call, well not leaked sorry they released a, a, a recording like video recording of of macron on the phone to putin and macron was super hard on putin like this he was actually really impressive so he was like what are your lawyers on if they think that's like i can't remember the exactly the phrasing but he was like giving putin he wasn't afraid of putin and do you know what my estimations in the man has gone up and also he wasn't just he hasn't just been visiting um baltic nations and important nations to do with ukraine but also like if you notice on our, our france is the biggest country involved in armenia at the moment and put and macron has been to armenia and his he is he is also arming Armenia with weaponry. He's also just been to Brazil. Like Macron is taking a lead and going to the places that freaking matter the most in this war. And if it's not directly involved with the war, uh, I think you've, you're muted, by the way. Uh, that's why I couldn't hear you. Sorry. Um, uh, but, but it's not just those places directly to do with the war, but also those places secondarily uh, to do with the war. I'll see if I can unmute you Uh I, I wonder why like I might have spoke over you because you might have been speaking, but I can't unmute you. You've got an issue there. Um, but I'll continue speaking there on your behalf, Anastasia. So so the idea is that, yeah, no worries. Uh, the idea is that, that Macron is uh, 
you know, picking up where the US has has been absent over the last six months. And as we've talked about, he is someone that has had to do it. And I think that that may play into his strategizing about where France needs to be, but also looking at where the EU needs to be and what its biggest threats are. And the EU's biggest threat is Russia. Russia, Putin's Russia, I think also sees the EU as its biggest threat rather than the US. And so this, there is an awful lot of uh, 4D chess going on. I think you're back. Oh, no, you're not muted now, but it's not, it's not uh, working. Um, But any, uh, oh, oh, I can just hear you. Yeah, you might need to just turn it up. Can you, can you hear me now? Yeah, but it's 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 a lot lower than it was. Uh, maybe in the settings, turn it up. I'll turn, I'll turn up my. Uh, speak again. If you speak next to it. Yeah, I can hear you. I'll let the uh, let the um, audience let us know whether they can hear you clearly enough. So maybe. I have no idea. Nothing. No, that's fine. You're fine. You're fine. You're fine now. You're back. Uh, that's oh, that's good. Okay. So. Uh, yeah. I agree can, uh, with what you said. Uh, can you hear me now? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think it's slightly lower than it was, but it but it is it's low, say people, but we can hear you. Why? What the hell? I changed not a single thing. Okay, <laughs> I, that, that's I don't know that's what all right. I guess keep keep uh, your mouth close to it or whatever. Yeah, just get, yeah, keep keep your mouth close to it, and then it 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 should be all right. But anyway, yeah, as we were saying, uh, you know, France has has really picked up. um, And when it comes to hitting the oil refineries, I think it's really significant that they've said, yeah, we're fine with that. And the US have said, no, we're not fine with that. And then we're starting to see this this kind of rift between allies, which is interesting. I don't think it's a dangerous rift, but I think it's it's suddenly places like France are saying, yeah, we're going to take the lead on this. And it doesn't matter if the US says that whatever they say, we're going to be strong. What what are the what are the views about Macron now among the among the Ukrainians? Are they seeing him as as now a major player? I think uh, it's kind of improved quite a bit uh, because the view of him. Uh, because, uh, like I said, he cut a lot of shit uh, for his initial. You know, uh, yeah. people like calling him peacenik and you know things like that. But it turns out that uh, it was mostly Zelensky. And even in uh, Macron himself even says to Zelensky, like, like, are you sure? Like, I don't think it's going to do anything. Like me, me talking with him, like, isn't going really to affect anything. And Zelensky is like, you mean you got to try, like, uh, if we can avoid this thing, then the, any chance, you know, we need to grab it. Which I understand, like, on both ends, obviously. But uh, also Macron taking, like, uh, a stronger stance is uh, appreciated, obviously, by people. And um, uh, when at the same time, the U.S. has, uh, fallen off quite a bit in Ukraine, opinion-wise. So, uh, first of all, we still are very grateful for everything that has been given to us prior, mm, obviously, mm. that didn't go anywhere. But this um, this cor- current situation is uh, is rough, and it makes the United States look like an unpredictable and unreliable ally, which uh, I think is not a look they should want, but it's what's happening. And also kind of like uh, the recent news about the um, demands, so to speak, of not uh, attacking Russia uh, and Russian oil, you know, within Russia uh, itself, has also dampened people's uh, um, attitude towards the United States, simply because, uh, let's put it like as, as straight as I can, but what I hear is you don't get us, give us aid for half a year and you make demands Mm-mm. <laughs> that's the wow. attitude basically on the block so to speak so people are a bit like, angry you can't really uh, you if you want to have such a big leverage and say in our operations that's fine but you need to earn it so if you actually like a reliable super duper great partner for us then that's one thing but not being that and also making demands is a bit you know right interesting yeah make, make, yeah yeah, made people a little bit not happy, so to speak. Not to say that we like everyone is like you know uh, U.S. No, but people are a little less pleased with the United States and a little less uh, um, happy uh, than they used to be. Let's say half a year ago. So yeah. 
I'd say this. And when it comes to Europe, everyone is, you know, obviously wanting here to for them to be more active and to be more independent and to be more e- even more invested in helping us than they already are. So, yeah. Uh, yeah so in that sense, having like a, a big sort of figure to do it is quite important. And if Macron manages to uh, to do it and to pull it off, so to speak, then you know, props <laughs> to yeah. him and to France as well. So. Yeah, uh, escalation wise well, is quite stupid, obviously, you know, because what can you escalate and a clear strike or something like at this but, point? But that is, that, like, but that's what they're worried about. I mean, yeah. that, that is, that is, that is the one, right? And I think when you look at the history of the US in the Cold War from 1950s to now, like it's always been part of their strategizing. And so this is no different to what it was in the Cold War and in, in Cuban yes, Missile but it's Crisis a different in time. Absolutely, yeah, but I think I think a there's situation. Yeah. Yes, I, I agree. And actually, when you look at all the red lines, see, they were worried about the red lines, the US particularly, in like giving away of M triple seven um howitzers about uh um high Mars, about main battle tanks, and then about F 16s But each time yeah, Ukraine has crossed that line, yeah. nothing has happened. Yeah. And so oil refineries for me should still be part of that. Well, they're clearly not gonna whack out the nukes with if you destroy their refineries. But the US yes, it's... obviously but the thing See? is the thing is Anna, you've got mm-hmm. to be you've like if you're not cautious then if they do whack out the the nukes and that's the end of the world. Do you know what I mean? So it's like the yes, erring... but uh, you can't count down to their threats. So they have been yeah. doing nuclear threats for I don't know even how long since I was a child, you know. So it's not really. And at each step we take, there is nothing going on. So the escalation they're doing is they're bombing us more, maybe uh, Ukraine in particular. So that's pretty much it. But uh, with our, I truly, genuinely don't believe they will ever get to use nuclear weapons and uh if there is uh, like such a risk it, it hasn't become so great that we have to handicap ukraine and we have to be handcuffed so not only people don't support us as i think they should but we are also especially the united states in particular but we, they also want us to fight handicapped so mm. they are allowed russia right to destroy our cities to destroy our power grid, to leave people in winter cold and brag about it on media, saying we will freeze those Ukrainians, those khakhli, as they say, you know, it's a derogatory mm. term towards mm. Ukraine. So they should be allowed to do that. They should be allowed to commit war crimes like as far as, as um, you know, as, as they breathe, they commit those, you know. They should be allowed to create biggest mass graves since Yugoslavia genocide in Izum, which is two hours right from my home. So they should be allowed to do all of that and we should be allowed to do anything we are not attacking their uh like indiscriminately bombing their cities we are not reckless with the with the long range missiles by the way which only uk had the guts to give us which is uh i think shadow shadow storm how, shadow how, storm shadow, shadow yeah 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 storm shadows yeah exactly thank you so we have very little of those since nobody gave us long range weapons like that. For example, Schultz is still going this whole like, oh, Russian, I don't know, German missiles, Taurus, I think they're called, will yeah. not be like shooting Russia. Oh, no, you know, uh, he's doing this. So because uh, they have so little of that and we use it smart and yeah. we use it carefully and with accordance with, uh, you know, laws of war. And uh, and uh, it's not illegal for us to attack uh, the oil productions of a country that illegally invaded our country and now is occupying it. You know, so because of that, um, yeah. So if if you if you genuinely not you in particular, but you know if people are genuinely in, invested as they say they are in Ukrainian victory, victory, not just you know keeping it 
afloat. <laughs> so if you're genuinely interested in that, then you can't uh, demand for us to be handicapped, handcuffed as we fight. It's handcuffed, yeah, handicapped. Yeah, not, yeah. So um yeah. It, interesting. Uh look, I I have to go in about 15 minutes because I've got to go and take yeah. uh, one of my boys to a sports um training. But uh, not yeah. anyone needs to know that. But I, I definitely want to continue because I think there's so much more to talk about, Anna. Is this something we can do again relatively soon? Yeah, yeah, definitely. We now have a schedule uh scheduling with the yeah. the like how it's called the like controlled blackout basically yeah. like it's our government right. now that turns down the the electricity thing because it's uh it's impossible to keep the entire city lit up at the same yeah. time so uh because of that i now have like a you know like a schedule i can yeah. look into so i can uh, now you know be more free with uh, how to organize things like talks with people and everything That's maybe brilliant. i can fix my camera I don't look like I'm uh, like I'm broadcasting from another from the I don't know <laughs> from Mars or something. And next time we talk, it's not gonna do this. But uh, yeah, I, I'm down, of course, and you know uh, it's always nice to cool. chat cool with beans. you. And you know, well, I'm yeah. gonna go through some thanks, and then there may be a, a question or two for you. I know I've got one question at the moment. Uh, I just yep. want to give some thanks to Richard Bennett, who is always a great support of the channel for those ATP geopolitics memberships, as well as Brian Ivy. I think Brian's just had to shoot off. But thank you, Brian. Uh, if you're catching this on replay, I really appreciate your support, mate. Um, uh, Javier Alvarez, Anastasia, uh, this is, these are truly hard times. What makes you hopeful that better things are coming? What can we do as a community to support? Uh, what makes me hopeful is, uh, just, um, uh, mostly it's just seeing my people in general, like still being, uh full scale you know invested yes a bit down sometimes obviously but overall still supporting each other still helping each other uh just just a couple of days ago i was you know visiting the soldiers and everything and seeing that i makes me hopeful because i know there are people so many people that are still um still invested in defending this country and keeping it preserving it and uh you know fighting for the for the for freedom from uh russia so i do think that's quite you know that's majestic to me that people are still so brave and so willing to go through various hardships uh and still you know hold on uh so yeah if they are not giving up then i definitely don't have any right to and also people of course like from the other countries like from the west who still support us who are still interested uh people who help me with the donations for example of course they're giving me a huge boost of uh, happies <laughs> and of hope because they do it does feel like people care and they do they show it you know with the <laughs> with actual donations with actual mm -hmm. money that they earned um that they help ukrainians with the volunteers and people like that so i say that's the, the best thing and of course what you can do is you can um support ukrainians and talk about it and you can go like if, i don't know where the person in in particular lives obviously but uh, you can go to uh you know vote for the politicians that support ukraine you can be vocal about it and you can if you're able to you can also donate to the you know volunteers and everyone who helps out and that's uh, at the end of the day it's the best uh, like a regular person can do in in you know in the in any country. Yeah, I, I would advise that if you're living in Europe or in America, because you've got you've got elections coming up. But I know it might not be that Ukraine is the most important thing to people out there. There are other things to concern yourselves with in your own society and what your different political parties are going to do. But it's about finding that sweet spot between how important Ukraine is to your political party or whichever political party mm -hmm. that also ticks some other boxes. For me, Ukraine is like the most important thing in my life at the moment because I think yeah. it's, it's you. very important. I, I think it's so, it. it's so important for global politics and for stability. And I think Russia, if we want to allow Russia to get, invade our heads with disinformation, then, you know, don't support Ukraine. But if we want, if we want to stop Russia in meddling in our heads and our politics we need ukraine to win on a battlefield and that is a prerequisite for defeating russia in the information space so I, I i like for me luckily in the uk it doesn't matter who i vote for in the next election generally speaking like the conservatives or the labor labor party are both strongly supporting ukraine so happy days there yeah mm -hmm. um uh, but for other other countries, you know, when it comes to European elections in June, just keep Ukraine in your mind with when you're voting. 
you know, really, really do. Uh, Johnny Christensen, super sticker. Thanks, mate. Really appreciate your uh, daily support there. Julian Rossiter, Rossiter, this is referring back to France and Emmanuel Macron. Uh, thanks, Julian. I can't mention the Battle of Agincourt anymore, JP. Well, of course, 1415, as everyone knows, <laughs> 1415 is a date, the Battle of Agincourt, where the, the French were defeated by the English and uh, yeah, whatever. Uh, but thanks, Julian. Thanks for the yeah. reminder. It's etched into my brain, of course. No Stephen jokes ben about the French anymore, I suppose. Yeah, yeah no, uh, we can't do yeah. it. It can't be done. A big love to the French. I love that. I've got, so I've got a degree in French, right? So I really have no oh, position to, so. That's uh, cool. Yeah. Um, uh, not really, because I can't really speak it anymore. It's been far, far too long. Oh, anyway, that's it's, a game. <laughs> that's a language, okay? <laughs> I it love is. it. But France, French is it pretty, is. pretty hot, okay? So it, it is a good language. <laughs> um, uh, Stephen mm. Bendel, really appreciate that. NATO will be strong also without you. So here's, here, thanks Stephen for, for being a member. Um, uh, J.R. Yeroun here saying, uh, what does Anastasia think of taking Russian land to later trade it for Ukrainian land? So if they can do it to you, can you do it to them? What do you think of the pro-Russian, pro-Ukrainian uh, Russia Free Legions fighting in the north of uh, north of Ukraine? You know, what's going on there? Uh, you mean like, uh, are they, are they called RDK? But I don't know how they called it. Yeah, yes, yeah. yeah. So the Russian Volunteer Corps, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I think... Well, I actually met some of them. They are pretty interesting people, let's put it like that. So uh, mm. I, I will not put like a blanket statement about yeah. all of them. But you know the guys who people think Azov is? Yeah. They are that those guys who guys yeah. who like Westerners think Azova. Uh, it's yeah. a very vague statement, but if you catch what I mean. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So there's uh, very like, they're Russian. Uh, Russian, okay. Yeah, the Russian nationalists, and uh, I do appreciate that they fight for us either way. So at the end of the day, that's the most important thing for me. And the, the fact that they do certain operations in Russian territory as well uh, is true, and I appreciate that as well. But as far as taking their land, no, it's not something I consider is uh, feasible to do. To be honest with you. I, yeah, I, I don't think that's something we will be any at any point doing, even with the idea of like some sort of exchange. I just don't yeah. see it. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah. Thanks to Kevin Forst for uh, ATP memberships. Uh, legend, mate. Really appreciate that. And for Remy Stevens for the super sticker. Very much appreciated. And Paul Gilbert supporting Ukraine with my Russian ex's money. Uh, poetic justice, in my opinion. Thanks, Anna and JP, for a great discussion. <laughs> Interesting. <laughs> Oh, um, that's cool. Wow. Wow. That's cool. There's a story in there, mate. Um, I just that's, wanna... uh, that's something I heard so far in my life. So, yeah, appreciate the, that. This this just made me laugh. I, I, sorry if this is inappropriate yeah, yeah. or anything, Anna. But I, I wrote just about to go live with, uh, with Anna. And then someone said, first time reading this, I thought you were going to live with Anna, just going to live with Anna. So um, I was wondering what your wife thought about the idea. Keep up the good work. By the way, I'm not going to go. Can I just <laughs> put that out there? I'm not going yeah, to go yeah, live with Anna. Let's, yeah. Yeah, At the very close. least, it's pretty dangerous here. So yeah. let's put that in mind first. <laughs> so I, I visited uh, Ukraine, Anna, and I probably should have um, should have contacted cool. you to say. That's so cool. I was there eight weeks ago and did a, did a uh, run along the front lines with some aid uh, with some guys I'm doing charity work with. And oh, that's we, awesome. I didn't know that. Yeah. And, and we're in Kharkiv, uh, Kharkiv for a night. And the night I left, they hit it. And it was when they hit the oil depot there. And there was a big, I think it was burning for ages. Uh, do you remember? About eight mm, weeks yeah, ago. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Something but, like that was going yeah. on there. Yeah. Um, uh, so uh, I want to point people towards uh, Anastasia's work that she does um in ukraine in in the fundraising can you let people know about the fundraising you're doing um yeah so i mostly do stuff on uh, my twitter and as well as reddit but that's you know whole other whole other thing most of my stuff is on twitter and uh if you want to support my well just if you like scroll a little bit 
uh, you could see me me buying the car I talked about recently. Oh, that that's it. Yeah. So uh, yeah, that's that's the car we recently bought. And if you want to support stuff like that and see like uh, what I do, the receipts and everything, you can uh, you know just follow me on Twitter or you can, for example, donate to my PayPal, which is somewhere there in the bio uh, at the top. So you can do that if you wish and if you have uh, means to. If you're able to, then you know that would be great because we're doing this stuff pretty regularly. And cars now are a pretty big problem because they are, first of all, expensive, but they uh, just get crushed all the time like with yeah. artillery fire, with mines, with all sorts of things. And uh, uh, yeah, so that's the main thing. I also am going to buy power banks soon, like do the fundraising for uh, like little energy boxes <laughs> that they need uh, there at the front. So yeah, so a anyone, any help is great. Like even if it's a little bit, it does help and does add up eventually. Yeah, for sure. Well, look, all I can say is I know that, that we, myself, Greg Terry, and Rick the Ukrainian and Professor Gerdes were all sort of running our... Um, our medevac armored yeah yeah you know rick yeah, yeah, yeah. he want by the way he wants to have a chat with you like a live with you so um yeah just to oh, let you know uh, we can so do it do obviously <laughs> yeah, yeah yeah i chatted um, with him a bit but i but i know that the the i'm running uh the char charity things that we're doing but but if you guys can support anastasia that will be absolutely fabulous uh, truly a, a a great um you know a, a great work it's great work that you do anesthesia is what i'm trying to say sometimes i struggle thank with my you. words um when i, I get out thank you when i get out to ukraine again which i think i will uh well i very much hope i will um we we should definitely hook up when i hit Kharkiv again which i'm sure i will so uh we'll we'll hopefully that'll happen yeah um you can you know message me anytime and you know i'm if i'm here i'm down obviously but i mostly just stay in Kharkiv like yeah. semi-permanently now so um, well, yeah. I'm uh, I'm quite upset that I haven't got to talk to you about the actual like the experiences of going through the the strike on Kharkiv the other day. Uh, that that that, uh, that we were yeah. unable to talk, and that was one of the big things I wanted to talk about. Your experiences. We can, are going... we can talk. Uh, I mean, soon if you want, like a couple of days or something like that. Yeah. Uh, no problem. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And uh, yeah, it was a bit big big thing that happened. <laughs> like it was like I think like something like 21 explosion or something like just in yeah. a succession like like that. Yeah. yeah so that was pretty fucking weird i was like in the corridor for most of the time just you yeah. know hiding there but it was quite a quite a thing and uh, yeah uh, we can definitely chat about recent attacks and everything and i also had like a very um, not pleasant experience with the drone <laughs> recently because it flew past my like basically window and then went a little bit further and exploded one minute or two away from my actual apartment so that was also wow. Not fun. So drones uh, yeah. inside. Wow. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So uh, and uh, yeah. So yeah. things like that we can definitely chat about, like how people are dealing with that and how they're like coping. Many yeah. people are a bit upset due to the increase in shelling in the recent weeks because yeah. you kind of get used to a bit of a quieter life, and then when it gets worse, it's very hard to get into that. Uh, mood of uh you know being in constant like adrenaline type of thing so uh yeah so it's a bit a bit rough and we can definitely you know chat about it yeah uh, definitely yep. yeah i look forward to that well let's do that next week sometime if you if you've got availability i'll, I'll contact you yeah. in the back channels mm -hmm. Nice one. Well, look, yep. I, I really massively appreciate this. Thank you so much for your generous time here. And please, can people be generous by following Anastasia on Twitter and for helping out? Thanks to JR, who's put the, her PayPal up. So please, if you feel uh, the the moral, um, I think if you're morally obliged to help out, then there's the way that you can do it. Uh, please do so. Uh, so thank you. Are there any last words you would like? And sorry, this is rather a quick ending. I was hoping this would, would go on for uh, it's fine, it's fine much longer. You. But but are there any final words that you would like to say? Well, I mean, I may come across as a little bit more um, less cheerful as I usually am. It's simply because of the, you know, certain hardships that have been going on recently. And uh, I don't want people to think that I'm like ungrateful for the help that, you know, they do give. So I just wanted to say that we appreciate everyone who stick with us and who 
have not uh, forgotten about us and have not, uh, you know, uh, just lost interest in, in us because um, people like that, especially like foreigners and Westerners and things like that, they do keep us uh, going at the end of the day. And uh, I appreciate you all and <laughs> thank you. I just wanted to say that it's very nice that people care and it's... Uh, it's an important uh, thing to me, but it's also an important thing to most people here, I believe, even who are not like volunteers and who are not directly, you know, interacting with foreigners as much. Oh, but I lost the headphone. <laughs> yeah. So in the middle of my speech, that's awful. So anyhow, point is that I do appreciate it and I want people to know that we love you and uh, we are grateful. And yeah, it's very, it's very, it has been something to see people care yeah. because it hasn't been like that ever in my uh, life and the life of previous Ukrainians, generations of Ukrainians, that someone gave any sort of care towards, you know, us. So now that people do, <laughs> it feels quite great and quite inspiring. So yeah, that's on a, on a, on a cute note we should end, I think. <laughs> Excellent. Well, uh, fantastic. And I'm going to be uh, supporting Anders this year later. So uh, please, please, you guys follow suit as well. Finish guide. Thanks to the super sticker and John Panciotti. Wow, that's insanely generous. I can't thank you enough. Thank you thank for you. your work. Uh, thank you, uh, John. That's really generous. And actually, while I'm here, can I just thank publicly Andreas Lurch? And uh, Richard Rock as well, who, who have been very generous, as many others have recently. So uh, just public thanks to those. Uh, look, thanks to Anna, who has been absolutely enthralling to speak to. And I hope, hope <laughs> that we can that we can uh, speak next week as well. Thanks, John, again. Um, and, uh, you know, I just hope that that there's some respite for for Kharkiv that is just getting hammered. And I wanted to speak to you about why air defences are difficult to put in place around Kharkiv and why they haven't been put there. But anyway, yeah, yeah. We, we'll, save that that, yeah. we'll save that for next time. Um, uh, thank you yes, very much. thank you for having me on. <laughs> I and, appreciate uh, it. Yeah, good luck. And yeah, Slava Ukraini. <laughs> Here I am, Slava. Thank you. <laughs> Excellent. Bye -bye. <laughs> take care, everybody. Stay on the line, Anna, and uh, everybody else. Take care. Uh, all the very best. Oh, she has gone, so that's not going to happen. Uh, take care, everybody. Really appreciate you supporting uh, Toodle Pips.